Welcome back, everybody. This is Seed Wars number 15, and this will be the final lecture today looking at this mandrake plant that also really means the mandragon plant. And I want to start off by saying that this is not a doctrine that I receive from anybody else uh, throughout the years in my time and study you pick up different ideas and different pieces of the puzzle from other folks but there's nobody else that i'm aware of who has presented um, this material that we've looked at in the last five lectures um, it's something that i discerned throughout my studies and I like to believe that it was the inspiration of the Lord, that it was the Holy Spirit who brought the revelation. Um, of course, that's always debatable. A lot of people have made those claims throughout history, some which were accurate and others which were not. And so really at the end of the day, it's up to the listeners to decide whether this is inspired by the Holy Spirit or not. But I've had those ask me, you know, where on earth did you you know, who did you hear this from? And the answer is nobody. This was not somebody else's teaching that I've stole or added to or manipulated to make my own. This, uh, this, all of this has come from my own thought, prayer, and study time. And so one of the things that we've looked at in the past is this idea that the Nakash, who is this diviner reptilian serpent being, that if he really did go into the garden and if he really did want to pursue making a serpent seed line, which is what Genesis 3.15 says he did, then the love apple really fulfills all of the criteria that the Nakash would have wanted to achieve this. If he was really looking to impregnate Eve with a seed, then this love apple would have been the perfect mechanism to do it because first, God told him not to eat of the fruit and it is obviously fruit. It's called the love apple or the devil's apple. So it fulfills that aspect. Secondly, it's a common aphrodisiac that helps stimulate the person for sexuality. And so it would help put people in the mood to procreate. So it fulfills that aspect. Third, it puts you in a hypnotized state, a disassociative state where you can be controlled and manipulated quite easily. And so from the Nakash's perspective, that would be highly advantageous. Number four, it's had notoriety of improving fertility, both increasing the virility of a man and their semen and increasing ovulation of eggs for the process of conception. So again, if you were trying to make a bloodline, this would be an advantage to use something like this for fertility purposes. Number five, it has a deep, rich history of witchcraft and sorcery, which is what the occult realm and Satan is all about. And that's why we see the love apple being used all throughout history in those aspects. And then lastly, we know that ancient folklore says that the reptilian serpent beings of antiquity were known for using roots and herbs to place people under a spell. And so in my opinion, it really fulfills all of the prerequisites necessary for helping produce a serpent seed line in the garden. Now, today we're going to look at other spiritual manifestations of the mandrake. And by that I mean the as above, so below paradigm ultimately says that what happens in the spirit realm manifests in the physical and vice versa. You cannot separate or untie the spirit and physical realm, even though we exist in the physical realm. And a lot of times we take it for granted that there's a spiritual realm. Nonetheless, that spiritual realm does exist. And often it is governing what's happening in the physical realm. In particular, the spirit realm and the occult realm are tied together hand in hand. And so today I want to look at some situations where on the surface, 
there is some symbolism that the obvious person would see. But then underneath the surface, as you peel the veneer, you'll see that there are deeper and occult meanings behind it. So today we're going to look at the Mandrake Hotel in London. Now this is one of the most expensive, famous hotels in Europe. It was named the Mandrake because um, there's a lot of symbolism throughout the hotel that has to do with dragon lore. And so on the surface, those who chose the name and the design of the building understood what it all meant. But also there's some deeper underlying symbolism that I think will be quite revealing as we move forward. Now, this is an image of the Mandrake over here. It's actually immersed and tucked away inside of a large forest-like area. I think what's fascinating about the Mandrake Hotel is that they claim it is a garden. In fact, we'll look at photos in a moment. Every single image you'll see of the interior is encased in different um, varieties of plants and shrubs. And so they've made the Mandrake a ethno-botanical garden. And I find that interesting because <clears throat> what we've said is that the Mandrake was the plant or the tree used in the Garden of Eden to put Eve under a spell. And so that's the first thing I would point out is that in this Mandrake Hotel, they just happen to have made it a garden. Now, the Mandrake has been curated and designed to offer an immersive and unforgettable experience. From our three-story high surrounding walls of jasmine and passion flower that form the living heart of the hotel, to our priceless and eclectic art collection, including the likes of Salvador Dali. So there's a couple things I want to mention here. Number one, the passion flower received its name because it was known to be an aphrodisiac very similar to the mandrake plant. In fact, the passion flower has been used for anxiety and insomnia because it has sedative hypnotic effects. And the reason why is, is it has the neurotransmitter GABA in it which works on the central nervous system. And so the passion flower can kind of put you in a, a, a disassociative state and in a state of arousal for lovemaking. And that's why they've named it the passion flower. Now there's obvious connections there symbolically between that and the mandrake. The other thing I would say of, of worth noting is that we did a lecture on Salvador Dali in the days of Noah series a very interesting lecture called the Aryan Christ. And I'll include that in the description box. But what we discovered is that Salvador Dali was a deep occultist. And in fact, he and all of his um, contemporaries who started the surrealism movement in the early 1900s, that entire movement was based on the occult. It was based on automatism, on um, allowing the entities to enter in and then doing automatic writing and automatic drawing. And so their art is charged. It's what I refer to as charged art because it was inspired from the spiritual demonic realm. And so we're seeing that, we're gonna see that that kind of art is what is displayed all throughout this um, hotel. Now, as we move forward, we're gonna see that they offer all kinds of interesting ethno-botanical cocktails and food. It's a fancy word for saying that they're using roots and herbs in different combinations to help create mind-altering effects. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to the layperson, but we have to understand in the book of Enoch, in Genesis 6, when the fallen angels descended from Mount Hermon onto the planet in the days of Jared and Enoch, they taught mankind the mixture of roots and herbs for the purposes of working through the pineal gland, which allows access to the do spiritual domain. The reason that the fallen angels did this is this is one of the mechanisms by which they could control humanity. Teach them how to use the roots and the herbs. Those roots and herbs put the people into a disassociative state. 
while in the disassociative state through the pineal gland that allows the demons to come in and interface with humanity in such a way that they can manipulate and control them. We're going to see that this is what the hotel is really based on. So here we see um, the front of the website, Mandrake. We know that stands for the Mandragora plant. The word Drake drives all the way back to dragons or mythological serpents. And um, obviously the word man means just what it says, that this is a man dragon or a reptilian type entity. Now, we see down here a plant, kind of reminds me of like a marijuana plant or opium. Notice if you look closely in the center, you'll see the dragon horns. I've given a few examples of that on the right. This is what your typical dragon horn looks like. Kind of this, this, uh, these curls here. Here's one goes up right there and the other goes right there. So they've kind of hidden some dragon horns in the design. Now most people aren't going to notice this because most people who go to the hotel, they have no idea what Mandrake means. They're just looking for a good time. They heard it was a cool place to get a drink and cool food, etc., etc. But as we've discussed in the past, the word occult means hidden, but in plain sight for those who understand. The other thing we see is the eye. And it probably has several meanings. Of course, anytime you see a single eye, we tend to think of the all-seeing eye, the eye of Lucifer or Horus, the, the light bearer. But uh, the other thing is, is it represents the third eye, the pineal gland. That's why it's right in the middle here because the pineal glands in the middle of the forehead. Notice that the pupils dilated because most of these herbs that have belladonna and hensbane and things like that, they cause vasodilation of the pupils. The other thing you'll see is the serpent tails all in the background. And I've included an image of a snake just so that you could see the typical patterns. You have these um, transverse black lines here. So that's definitely uh, a snake or a reptile tail without question. And then lastly, we have the color spectrum of purple. That represents the mythological dragon, the phoenix. We're going to look at that very closely in a moment. So you can see there's quite a bit of symbolism. It says on the, on the front, stay beyond yourself. And so there's a little occult meaning there. To stay beyond yourself, what does it mean to go beyond yourself? It means to open up a portal to a higher dimension and to allow yourself to disassociate from our four-dimensional time space into that higher dimension. That's how you would stay beyond yourself. And I would say on the superficial level, you know, Mandrake is a plant and they're serving different plant-based drinks and food. And so it stands the reason that they would include it in a garden. And that's on the superficial level, that's true. But on the deeper occult level, it represents the Garden of Eden where the mandrake plant was used to deceive Eve. Now, when you come into the lobby of the hotel, the first thing you see is two large trees. And you could say, well, they just did that for visual effects and symmetry. But remember, there were two trees in the Garden of Eden in the midst of the garden. There was the tree of life and there's the tree of knowledge. And I would suggest that the deeper occult symbolism here is that these two trees represent the two trees in Eden. And we see some of the symbols that they use for the hotel. Little, little simple things like this image here. They've gone to great uh, lengths to include the serpent skin, the dragon scales like we see down here on these dragon scale gloves. Um, we see the mandala effect. Mandalas are part of sacred geometry. They're used in witchcraft and the occult, you know, the eight-pointed star, the five-pointed star, the six-pointed star. All of those sacred geometric shapes are used to help facilitate occultism. And so I'm sure that's probably the deeper meaning of why those are there. See, they say here, this is where the art and the spirit reside. And so 
what they're suggesting is that there is a spirituality associated with this place. And there is, in my mind, no doubt that that's true. I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit, but I believe as we move forward, we'll see that it's another spirit that's operating through this place. So when you look at the art, it's very unusual. You know, for example, here in the middle, we see a little green looking goblin. And here is some kind of dead guy. And here is a skull and bones, which represents death. And here's a woman with black eyes. So you can see that there's kind of this dark, these dark undertones, these different concepts. Most of the art in the hotel will always have something below that reflects its image, like these tables, for example. And in the occult realm, that would represent the as above, so below, the mirror image or the reflection of, uh, of the artwork. This is what they say about their artwork on the website. And there's a lot of uh, occult words used here that have double meaning. The artwork of the mandrake embodies the spirit and the soul of the spaces that you encounter. They communicate with you as you enter a room with excitement, provocation, and contemplation. Now, on the superficial level, they'd say they speak to you. They, they communicate with you in your mind. But the deeper innuendo here is that there's really a spirit at work through the occultism being displayed and that it's that spirit that's speaking to your mind. Often playing with the narratives of darkness and light, there is a common theme amongst the collection. Now, the average person would think of darkness and light in terms of how, they, how much ambient light there is in the room, literal light. But I would say that we're actually talking about the narrative of true darkness and light, as in the good light and the false light. Continuing on, the works bring provocation. They're sensual and exotic and beautiful. And, and that has to do with the idea of, of sexuality, of course. And sometimes they're even dark and creative. Each and every piece has been sourced for the specific area it occupies. Where the perfect work has not been found, artists have been commissioned to work closely with the space and the ethos of the hotel to create the right spiritual environment. So, yes, it's true. Different artists, different people have come in and decorated the place but these people most likely are under the the deluding influence and when they pick art from people like salvador dolly in their mind they're just picking this cool unique interesting art but if they studied the artists they'd find that those people were all deeply enshrouded in the occult and that all of their art was inspired by the demonic realm and so you begin to see that the demonic realm is, has inspired the formation of the hotel, the occult symbolism behind it, the different artist pieces that are being used. And that's what makes it very interesting. Now, some may say, you know, you're just reading into it too much, Dave. Um, it, it, it doesn't really have all those deep symbolic occult undertones. But we need to keep looking at it closely and try and unpack everything that they're trying to insinuate. And I think this here will give the best representation. We see a woman here sitting on her hands and knees and she's playing with these different pots with different plants and things like that. So she's a sense, essentially mixing up different elixirs, if you will, of different chemicals. And that's called sorcery, the mixture of, of herbs and roots. We see a lot of uh, New Age items, like this crystal pyramid here. And we know that the pyramid pointing up is the human realm trying to connect with the pyramid pointing down, which is the spirit realm. So this symbol here demonstrates that what she's trying to do is to open up a doorway to the spiritual realm. We see incense in the back with mist. 
we see a mandala here, a, um, a dream catcher. Now, a dream catcher comes from Native American artwork, and that's a, that's a paganistic system. And that's why when you look at the dream catcher, the circle represents a portal. The mandala inside is the sacred geometry that opens the doorway. Now, from a Christian perspective, I can assure you, this thing doesn't catch bad dreams. I've met a lot of naive Christians who were unsuspecting and didn't know, and they're hanging these things over their baby's crib, thinking that it's going to help catch the, the, bad, the bad dreams. But in reality, it's the exact opposite. All you've done is put a, an occult item in your house, which is now a doorway to the second heaven in the spiritual realm. And so you're just inviting um, unwanted things into your life. And so I would strongly um, recommend against that. But notice what it says on the cover. What she's portraying here is spiritual, the spiritual well-being program. How to awaken your soul with our weekly events. So to awaken your soul means that you're going to um, open it up to the demonic realm. This is what they describe as happening. Sound healing is an ancient practice, one which is used to guide people into a state of deep relaxation and peace through various musical instruments, including gongs, crystal bowls, conches, and Tibetan bowls, which are played to put the mind into an alpha and theta brainwave rhythm, which enables the mind to expand the consciousness and go into a dream-like state. Now, I find this amazing and, and very fascinating because we've looked at this in many different facets throughout the Days of Noah series. We've shown time and time again that for example, we did a lecture on binaural beats, which also puts the mind in the alpha theta brainwave state. Turns out that that is the state of mind that allows for astral projection, lucid dreaming, and opens up the pineal gland. And so that's exactly why they're, they're using the crystals and the Tibetan bowls. All these things change the vibration and frequency to such a level that allow the demonic realm to come in. And we've looked at all that through the New Age movement in the past. And they even admit here that it expands the mind's consciousness to go into a dreamlike state. This deeply meditative place enables healing, not only on an emotional level, but on a cellular level too, with the sound and the vibration and the frequencies bathing every cell of the body to give a sonic massage. Now, that comes directly from this uh, instrument over here, the Integratron. We did a lecture in the Days of Noah series, which I'll include in the description box, where this man claims that he was communicating telepathically with aliens from Venus, and they telepathically downloaded him the blueprints to this UFO-looking structure, which he built. Now this structure is based on a Tesla coil and a split ring resonator. And a Tesla coil is something that Tesla came up with. He was deep into the occult. He was communicating with the demonic realm. And they are the ones who inspired some of the amazing ideas that Tesla had. I've shown in past lectures that a lot of the famous um, inventors were all in the occult guys like Leonardo da Vinci and Tesla, they, they didn't just get their ideas from an overactive imagination, but those ideas were being stimulated from the demonic realm because they were dabbling in occult practices. Now, the guy who came up with the Integraton's name is George Van Tassel. And George Van Tassel taught that this Integraton could, could bring healing to the body. He said that every single cell in the body has its own electromagnetic frequency and that the DNA acts like a fractal antenna 
and it picks up on electromagnetic waves and that when you went into this room up, up here above, they play certain music, they have crystals, they have magnets, and that it, it produced what was called a sonic bath. When you went into that building, you were taking a sonic bath and supposedly it would recharge your cellular structure the same way that you recharge a battery of a car. Now, in my opinion, it does just the opposite. It, it, it puts your uh, electromagnetic frequency of your body into the proper state to receive the spiritual energy coming from the second heaven, the spiritual domain, the demonic realm. And I've said many times in the past, human beings are nothing more than a, an antenna, that whatever we try and tune into is what our body begins to receive. And so anybody who goes and dabbles in this stuff in the Mandrake Hotel, they participate with these different spiritual well-being events that involve all of this occultism. Although they may feel, you know, excited and, and rejuvenated mentally, you'll find that those people are the furthest away from Christ that they could be. They may have accepted the universal Christ consciousness, which is the New Age idea, but they have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as their Savior. And this, this Antichrist spirit that they're receiving It'll, it'll appeal to the flesh and make them feel wonderful in various ways, but it will also continue to take them further and further away from the truth of the, of the biblical scripture. And that's just my opinion. So essentially what we're dealing with here is, is a blending of Eastern mysticism and the New Age movement, which both of those immerse themselves in the concept of transcendental meditation and guided meditation to put yourself into an altered mental state. Now keep in mind, I believe that we've identified the source of this transcendental altered state that all of the occult, the new age, and the Eastern mysticism indulge in. And I believe that goes back to the garden. See, these practices that have been going on for thousands of years through witchcraft and sorcery and continue to be pervasive in today's world, they had a source. And that source was a spiritual demonic source. And the two primary sources are, number one, the garden event, because we know that the Nakash, the serpentine being that walked into that garden, his name means the diviner or the soothsayer who puts a spell on you. And we've discovered that the word enchantment, where you use roots and herbs to, to achieve that, also derives from the word nakash. So that's, that's confirmed. And then the second event is three chapters later in Genesis 6, in the book of Enoch, when the fallen angels teach mankind how to use the roots and the herbs. And so we're, what's mind-blowing to me is here we are 6,000 years later after the garden, and we're still seeing... Uh, the fruit of those seeds that were planted back then. The Nakash is the one who basically invented the concept of transcendental uh, meditation, and mankind continues to employ that today. And so as you can see, the devil's in the details. Now, we also have uh, this, this alien technology that's being uh, played out here. You know, the Integraton is alien technology. It comes from extraterrestrials, which I believe are clearly, we've demonstrated, are nothing more than spiritual phenomenon. They are the fallen angels repackaged in a new age, high-tech, sophisticated way as greys and reptilians and Nordic aliens. That's what I believe we're dealing with in these accounts. They go on to advertise something called 666 at the Mandrake. They say that you can count your closest on one hand. So in keeping with government guidelines and to celebrate the month where the veils are thinnest between the worlds, that's the month of October during Halloween, we have created 666 in the Mandrake, an enchanting stay that offers a bed for the night for two, 
a private dining cabana for six people, and a six-course tasting menu and six glasses of bubbly, all for $666 or lira. And so, obviously, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to rep recognize the number 666. That is associated with the Antichrist in the book of Revelations and the manifestation of the mark of the beast in the beast system. And so they're, they're demonstrating here that this man dragon hotel is connected to Satan in 666. I find it interesting that they included the word enchanting because we see that word being used twice in the Bible in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or uses divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. What's really interesting is that the word enchanter is Strong's 5173 Nakash and it comes directly from the serpent being who entered the garden. It means to place an incantation or a spell over somebody. And so as you can see, that was the ultimate Freudian slip. When they, and, and, and let's face it, 99.9% .9 of the population, they're not gonna be able to see the deeper innuendos here. I mean, a lot of people will pick up on the 666, but they're not gonna think much of it, let alone right here in the advertisement, they actually use the word enchanting which is the same exact word for the reptilian being, the Nakash, who entered into the garden and used the mandrake plant to place a mind-altering spell over Eve. To me, that's a very uncanny um, connection and revelation right there. So as you come into the hotel to register, I believe that they have a room here that is very interesting. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, display on the eyes, I would believe that this sort of represents Eden right here. And as you walk into this garden, this Mandrake Hotel garden, you're getting ready to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We see a reptilian a serpent dragon tail here. And then in the middle here, we see this large bird, which is actually a dragon. It represents a phoenix. And we're gonna take a look at that next. Now, I've had some very interesting epiphanies uh, the last couple of days putting this lecture together. For some reason, I was always under the um, idea that the phoenix was a bird. And I've done some really interesting lectures in the Days of Noah series on the phoenix. It goes back thousands of years. It's always been used with the royal bloodlines and all of their coat of arms, and it's been used in different currencies, and I'll include that lecture in the description box because it's, it's really a fascinating lecture, but there's some deeper um, revelations that I want to share. The original phoenix was not a bird, but rather it was a dragon, as we see displayed over here, the phoenix dragon, and for whatever reason, I just wasn't able to see that before. I, they always, when, whenever you look up a phoenix, you know, ancient legends say that it was this mythological bird. But if you go back far enough, you'll find that it, it, that comes from the connotation of a dragon. And I'll, I'll explain that more as we proceed forward. See, in ancient folklore, a phoenix is a long-lived bird, but actually it's a dragon that cyclically regenerates or is otherwise born again. It was associated with sun worship, the rising of the sun. And the phoenix obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. The legend says that it dies in a show of flames and combustion, and then it decomposes before being born again. So the fact that Every time you see a phoenix, you'll always see it displayed in fire. It should be the giveaway that it was never really a bird, but rather it was a dragon because 
birds can't produce fire, but dragons can. And as the lecture goes on, we're going to see a close association between dragons and birds. But it turns out that the occult realm have always used the phoenix, particularly the New World Order. Their, their motto has always been Ordo Ab Chao, order from chaos. In other words, they produce the chaos, and then out of the ashes of the chaos, they produce the order. We see that happening in the world now. We see it happening in America. Um, they're purposefully destroying the currency. They purposefully have manufactured a pandemic. They're doing everything they can to destroy the old system. And then out of the, the ashes of that dying system will birth the new system. That's what the phoenix represents. The phoenix destroys itself and then out of the ashes of the old, birth the new. Now we see over here on the right, it's the, the double-headed phoenix has always been part of the Babylonian mystery religion symbols. That's why we see it in the Masonic fraternity. We see here that there's a 33 that represents the 33rd degrees of Freemasonry. It has the pyramid pointing down, which represents the spirit world linking up with the human world, the as above, so below uh, philosophy. The reason that it's double-headed is because it's the law of reversal. The, the, the left versus right paradigm or the upside down versus right side up paradigm. You always usually see the, the crown above it because it represents the royal bloodlines of the Illuminati. And if you go back, and we will do this in future lectures, if you go back and look at all of the Merovingians and the Carolingians and all of the European royalty, you'll see dragons and phoenixes all throughout the royal bloodlines because that's they're part of the, that Illuminati bloodline system. And in today's Hollywood, you'll see a lot of movies and things, for example, the X-Men, which is about genetically modified um, superheroes, and it talks about the rise of the phoenix. That is, a, from an occult standpoint, that's talking about the rise of this new world order beast system that's upon us now. Now, in past lectures, we demonstrated where the purple phoenix comes from. It comes from the land of Phoenicia, Tyre, and Sidon. Now, the Sidonians and the Phoenicians were Canaanites. The Canaanites were the seed of the serpent in the Old Testament. They were the wicked bloodlines that um, David and Saul and all of them were put in charge of wiping them all out, every man, woman, and child. And when you study those closely, you find out that those were the giants, like the Amorites, like King Og of Bashan and, and Goliath and all of them. And they were Nephilim hybrid strains. And that's why God put the Israelites in charge of destroying them. And so the phoenix dates all the way back to the Nephilim. And the reason that it's purple is because the Phoenicians who lived on the coast, Tyre and Sidon are coastal cities, they would gather up all of the shells that produce the purple dyes. And they use those purple dyes to create all of the purple embroidery and drapery that was used for royalty. And that is how purple became the color for royalty. In fact, we see during the crucifixion of Christ that the Romans were mocking Jesus as the king of the Jews by draping a purple um, drapery around his shoulders, trying to mock that he was a king. And that has deep meaning going back to the Nephilim seed of the serpent bloodline. And I, I, I'll leave a um, link to the de, in the description box of that particular lecture that goes into great detail about the Phoenician Canaanites and, and all of these symbols. Now, what we see happen over time, like we see in most folklore, is that there's little subtle changes. Over time, the phoenix, which is a dragon, eventually becomes the bird. 
and specifically the eagle. And that's why we see the eagle being used all throughout history on the Roman standards. We see it in the Greek culture. We even see it on the American dollar. And if you go back and you look at the original drawings of the symbols on the dollar bill, the original eagle was supposed to be a phoenix, but they shrouded it as an eagle. And we see that even in Nazi Germany, the Third and Fourth Reich use the large eagle on the front, but in reality, that eagle derives from the phoenix. See, it's not a coincidence that the double-headed phoenix has always been one of the royal symbols for communism in Russia. We see it all throughout the Holy Roman Empire with the German kings and the different royal bloodlines. Sometimes they display it in the ancient ways as the phoenix, like this image here. And then later it becomes the double-headed eagle because they look very similar. And this is their way of, of enshrouding uh, the, the phoenix in, in symbolism. It's not a coincidence that we see the double-headed eagle or phoenix on occult writings like Albert Pike, who was a 33rd degree Freemason who wrote Morals and Dogma. He includes the double-headed phoenix on his book, and whenever you study all of the Masonic regalia, they're always wearing the different versions of the phoenix. Now, if you go back far enough, the phoenix derives from the word grypho, which means curved or a hooked beak. And it turns out that the word grypho is where we get the word griffin. Now, if, if you're familiar with a mythological griffin, it was a legendary hybridized winged dragon that goes back to ancient Babylonian, Sumerian, and Greek times. It was often paired with the Sphinx, which is also a hybridized uh, entity with a lion. And so essentially, a phoenix is the same thing as a griffin. And where it gets interesting is that the phoenix and the, and the griffin drive all the way back to ancient Akkadian. And Akkadian was the language spoken of in the Semitic tribes of Sumer and Mesopotamia. You know, the Sumerian writings are said to be the oldest writings in the world. They call that the cradle of civilization, where everything uh, really kicked off about 6,000 years ago. And the original word for the griffin and the phoenix was the word caribou, which means a winged dragon or an angel. In fact, this word caribou is where we get the word carib, which is really spelled like this with a K, carub. So the, the, cherub, the cherubim angels in the Bible, that word derives from the Sumerian Akkadian word cherubim, which means a winged dragon or an angel. And so what we're seeing here is that the mythological phoenix or the griffin actually derives from the fallen angels, which is very interesting. Now, the griffin is a legendary creature that has the body and tail and legs of a lion and the head and the wings of an eagle. But actually, the original versions are a dragon and it's a hybrid creature. And then around the 1200s in the old Latin English, we begin to see the word griffin take on the notion of a large bird of prey. And that's why today we have animals like the griffin vulture, because a lo these large birds look a lot like dragons. And so that's where we start to see the symbolism shift from a dragon to a bird. Now down here, you see what a, a, the original griffin looks like. It has a head like an eagle and wings like an eagle. It's really a dragon. And it has the body and the feet of a lion. It's a hybrid. So where on earth did they get that idea? Well, we just found out that it, it dates back to the Akkadian word car caribum with a K or, or a cherubim angel. So we have to take a look at what a cherubim angel looks like, and we'll begin to understand where this hybridization mythology comes from. See, if you go back to the book of Ezekiel, 
they actually describe the cherubim angels, these living creatures who have the appearance and likeness of a man. They had four faces, four different wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnishing brass. They're known as the shining ones. That's one of the definitions of the Nakash, a shining one. In Ezekiel 10, it says they had the four faces. The face of a cherubim shows the face of a man, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. And so what we see is that the cherubim angels are hybrid creatures. That's how God made them. They have angel wings, which are really dragon wings. And then they have different features of man, lion, a bull, and an eagle with bull's feet. And when you start comparing that to some of the hybrids that we see in antiquity, like the Babylonian hybrids, like Nimrod, here's a display of Nimrod. He has a human head, angelic dragon wings, and a bull's body. He's a hybrid creature. Well, it turns out that he is just a Babylonian display of the cherubim and seraphim angels. And this makes sense to me because these are the angels that came down in Genesis 6 and began to mate with the women to create the giants and all of the hybrids. And if these angels were already created by God as these hybrid creatures, then naturally when they start mixing their DNA with humans, you're going to see a combination of a, of a part human, part hybrid looking angelic being that displays some of these different qualities. So this is the original likeness of the angels, at least the cherubim. And you may say to yourself, well, how on earth did they have sex with the women in Genesis 6? And we have to consider that they're shapeshifters. The fact that God made them in this hybridized form that they have the DNA of all these different creatures, lions and men and angels and bulls and eagles. They can move in and out of these different forms. And so it's likely that they presented themselves as uh, more human than something like this. But even though you can shapeshift and present yourself as some kind of illusion, the DNA still codes for the hybrid being. And so when you introduce that DNA with a human woman, you're going to get all kinds of amalgamations. Not only did you produce giants, but this is likely the explanation for all of the ancient mythological creatures that we see. Entities like the Sphinx, which uh, the riddle of the Sphinx, which has a pharaoh's head superimposed on a lion's body. Or the centaur and the minotaur, which is a half human and a half bull. And so you begin to see that these are all different representations of this hybridization. And that also doesn't include the fact that in the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees, it says that the angels would go on to mix the different orders and species of animals with other animals. So ultimately what we see is a vast level of hybridization. And it makes one wonder if the reason why they didn't do that was to try and recreate mankind in their own image and their own likeness. I mean, after all, if the, if the angels were hybrids to begin with, then it stands to reason that they would try and create hybrid beings as a direct image of themselves. And so when you go back to the Babylonian cuneiform tablets and you look at the ancient Akkadian and Sumerian language, you see that the original cherubim angels, where the cherubs in the Bible come from, they were dragon wings with dragon heads. But over time, those dragon wings and dragon heads became eagle wings and eagle heads. And so it makes one wonder if the modern interpretations haven't been distorted over the 5,000 years. Because we know that seraphim are the fiery flying serpent angels. But where we get tripped up is that the cherubim don't appear to have reptilian qualities. And we know that Lucifer is a cherubim but we also know that he's the Nakash. So there appears to be a contradiction there. The Nakash was a serpent being who went into the garden. He clearly has reptilian features, 
But cherubim angels, which were told in Isaiah that um, Lucifer was, on the surface, they don't appear to be reptilian until you understand the origins and realize that what you're dealing with is in the original accounts, the angel wings are not bird wings. They're dragon wings. And the angel eagle is not a bird head, but it's a griffin or a dragon head with a curved beak. And therefore, that would explain how Lucifer does have reptilian qualities because he does have part, rep, uh, part dragon features. So to summarize, in essence, you could say that these are all the same thing, that a phoenix is nothing more than a dragon or a griffin, and all three of those date back to the angels. And that's why when you look at these creatures, they have a lot of similarities. The griffin looks a lot like a dragon, and it looks a lot like a phoenix, and that's because they are essentially different renditions of the same thing, and the source point is the fallen angels who have different features that over time have given us these different versions of the mythos. And then over time, you know, people don't talk about dragons and griffins anymore because they don't believe in that. And so these things around the 1200s, they started to change. They started to become these large birds of prey because the large birds of prey demonstrate a lot of the same characteristics. They've got the huge wingspan like dragon wings. And they've got the similar head with a beak of a dragon. And that's how all of the vernacular shifted from a phoenix who was really a dragon who later became, in today's world, a mythological bird. Now, there is an interesting ancient text that kind of corroborates some of these notions. Now, it is a Gnostic manuscript. And if you know anything about Gnosticism, in many ways, it is averse to Christianity. They claim that Lucifer was the good one, that Adam and Eve were trapped in Eden, and, and um, it was Lucifer the light bearer who revealed to them the truth of good and evil so that they could choose their own way. So they've, in a lot of ways, they've misinterpreted and flipped the scriptures, the law of reversal. They've reversed everything. But that being said, not all of their writings are inaccurate. There are many truths mixed with many falsities, and it requires discernment to know the difference. And we have a Gnostic manuscript called On the Origin of the World. It comes from the Nag Hammadi Library, which is a collection in Egypt that dates back to the 4th century AD. And this is what they say. Thus, when Sophia Zoe saw that the rulers of darkness had laid a curse upon her counterparts, she was indignant. Now, Sophia Zoe to the Gnostics is basically the Holy Spirit. In our Bible, in the King James Bible, Sophia means wisdom, and it's always in reference to God's wisdom. And the word Zoe means life, the living soul or vitality which animates every living thing that was ever created. So, Zovia Zoe is the wisdom and breath and life of God, when, when the breath and life and wisdom of God saw that the rulers of darkness, that's the fallen angels, had laid a curse upon her counterparts, that's the Adamic race, humans. And coming out of the first heaven with full power, she chased those rulers of darkness out of their heavens and cast them into a sinful world so that there they should dwell in the form of evil spirits upon the earth. That's exactly what the scriptures in both 2 Peter and Jude allude to, as well as the book of Enoch, that after the fallen angels made it with the women and, and brought this curse upon mankind and created the Nephilim, that God judged the world, he destroyed them all with a flood, and all of the disembodied spirits that came out of the dead Nephilim were now trapped on the planet as evil spirits upon the earth. And look what it says next. So that in their world it might pass the thousand years in paradise, a soul-endowed living creature called a phoenix 
which kills itself and brings itself back to life as a witness to the judgment against the fallen angels, for they did wrong to Adam and his race. You see that? What the text is insinuating is that the phoenix, the dragon, the mythological bird, is essentially the official symbol symbolizing the corruption of the fallen angels with the humans and the curse that they laid upon humanity, specifically the race of Adam. They're acknowledging that there's two races. There's this race of Adam, and there's this other race, this serpent race. And so I find that very, very interesting, and that's what the research reveals. The phoenix, which is the oldest known occult symbol going back all the way through the Canaanites and the Nephilim clans and still being used today by the New World Order and all of the occult mystery writings, is nothing more than an ancient fire-breathing dragon that can be connected back to the seraphim and cherubim angels who contaminated the human gene pool in Genesis 6. Now, as a confirmation to all this, something very unique happened, something that I believe was far greater than a coincidence. In fact, you can't find the word coincidence or chance in the Bible, in the Hebrew, or the Greek, because those notions don't exist. Today, we like to say, Things are a coincidence when they when they happen to line up. They happen to coincide with each other, and we say, well, what a coincidence. But in reality, there are forces at work, both good and bad, and, and things happen, and, and what happens in the spirit manifests in the physical. I'm going to give you an example of that now. On Sunday, when I was putting together this lecture, and we have to keep everything in context here, I happen to be doing a series on the seed wars, a very unusual series about this serpent seed line in the reptilian race. That in itself is a quite bizarre topic. And then on Sunday, I'm putting together lecture number 15, specifically about the griffin, the phoenix, and the dragon. As I complete the lecture, I leave my bedroom, and as I walk out into the living room, my oldest daughter, who coincidentally his name is Sophia, God's wisdom, is watching a movie on the television. This bottom left image is an image of my living room. There's the TV. I took a picture of it. Now, I wanted to get a timestamp with the actual date, but all it would say on it was today, 12.43 p.m. And unfortunately, I'm not very techie, so I didn't know how to put the date on there. I did block out the city with black that I live in just for obvious reasons of anonymity. But I was able to document this um, revelation, or, or should I say confirmation, excuse me. So I'm putting together the lecture. I walk out into the living room. I look up, and my daughter's watching Dr. Doolittle. And there's an image of Dr. Doolittle talking to a dragon. And then a couple seconds later, they zoom in on the dragon's eye. And I see my large flat screen TV in my living room with this central image right here of a big, huge reptilian eye. And naturally, I'm thinking to myself, what are the odds that I'm doing a lecture series on reptilians, and I've talked about this eye, and now I'm walking out and I'm seeing a reptilian eye? That's pretty bizarre. So I decide to go into the living room and watch it for a few minutes. And what happens is, after Dr. Doolittle helps out this dragon, the dragon opens up a portal to a higher dimension where Dr. Doolittle can now access a place called Eden a garden. And the reason that he's going into the garden is because he has to procure the magic fruit hanging from the tree in the garden. Now, it doesn't say if it's the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but we can assume it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It has magic fruit. And you ask, well, why does Dr. Doolittle need the magic fruit? And it turns out that earlier in the movie, we learned that in Britain, the queen, Queen Victoria, was poisoned by drinking tea that contained the deadly ingredients known as deadly nightshade, which let me remind you is belladonna, the primary ingredient in the mandrake plant. And upon procuring the magic fruit, 
Doolittle is able to go back to Britain, and he's able to save the queen by giving her the magic fruit of Eden. And so, if you've been following the lecture series, then you can understand that the potential, the, the amount of possibility of this happening is so random. I don't know how to calculate the probabilities, but the fact that I'd be working on the serpent seed line, the reptilian race, doing a lecture series on the dragon and the reptilian eye, and I've already displayed the concept of the deadly nightshade being used in the mandrake plant to put a spell on Eve in the Garden of Eden. When you start connecting all of these dots, you begin to realize that it's outside of the normal realms of possibility. And in my opinion, it is a confirmation from the Holy Spirit and from the Lord. And I was grateful to receive that. And I wanted to document that because I felt that the listeners deserve to see that. Now, there are going to be people who scoff at that or, or, or you know, just kind of blow it off and say, what a coincidence. And, and that's fine. But as the Lord is my witness, this is exactly how it happened. And I'm not, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't swear to God. Jesus says, let your, your yea be yea and your nay be nay. But we do see out the scripture that people will say, the Lord is my witness, meaning they're not swearing to God. We shouldn't do that. But the Lord truly is my witness. He is watching upon me now. And when I say that this happened and that he's my witness, then if I'm lying, then um, the Lord will have to deal with that later when, when uh, the judgment rolls around. And so the Lord is my witness. This is exactly what happened when I stated it happened. And so uh, I think that that is a very amazing confirmation and um, um, gives uh, some increased credibility to the lecture, in my opinion. And so quickly, I just want to get through the rest of this lecture so it's not too long. But here in this Garden of Eden where the phoenix is, you can clearly see the serpent tail. I included an image of that here. If you go into the Mandrake bar, you see an image of a dragon with horns. And down below, you see its reflection, the as above, so below. Almost every room has imagery of duality. The pillows over here that balance the pillows over here. The lights that balance the lights here. The two mirrors on both sides. You know, all throughout this imagery, you see a very well-balanced room. And you'd say, well, that's just for sim um, symmetry. But they didn't have to put two of these mirrors here. But the spirit that was at work, the, the occult nature of the spirit that was that was inspiring the hotel, was putting the duality of the two seed lines, the two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And that's why we see it all throughout the symbolism. And I believe that we see that confirmation over and over when we look at the close details. You see a lot of occult symbolism. For example, here we see the as above, so below. The classic triangle pointing up and the classic triangle pointing down here and there. And again, people will say, well, they just happen to put that there. No, that's not how it works. Those symbols are very prominent, powerful occult symbols. Now, whether the people who designed the room did it on it intentionally, or whether they just thought that that looked cool, and it was really the, the inspiration of the spirit working through these people, is anybody's guess. But at the end of the day, the symbols are the symbols, and they don't lie. You know, every aspect of the hotel, we see these very interesting looking chairs that look like they're almost made out of a living creature and this this light even looks like it's alive and you have little images like this which has a, a triangle pointing up and a triangle pointing down it's all the deep occult symbolism of the spirit that's manifesting throughout the hotel and the same thing in this dining room if you look above uh, there's a large mural that we'll look at in a moment and it it's full of dragon features and then in the background over here, you see an image. It looks like a human woman with legs and a torso and breasts. And it has a dragon reptilian looking head. So it's a hybrid. And so what I believe is happening is that I believe the Lord has brought 
me to the Mandrake Hotel as a confirmation, if you will, of this same spiritual phenomenon that's been on the planet since the very beginning. And it continues to work throughout humanity today. And we're seeing that demonstrated in the engineering of this hotel. And that concept may be beyond most people's worldview, that they don't understand that there is a very intelligent, supernatural, sophisticated spirit that's operating and governing in our universe, in our cosmos, over our planet, and it's working through most of the people, particularly those who haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, don't have adequate prayer life in, in their life. They're not being covered by the protection of the Lord. And so naturally, the supernatural spirit can work through them. That's why the scripture says that the one in us is greater than the one in the world. But if you don't have the one in us, if you don't have the Holy Spirit governing your life, then that means you're under the influence of that other spirit in the world. And that other spirit in the world is going to utilize you in many different ways that seem unharmful, so to speak, but it will always have an occult nature wrapped up inside of it that will tend to leave people astray in terms of drawing them closer to Jesus Christ. You know, the different bedrooms display artwork on it, like this image here of a woman with dragon wings, a hybrid. And so what you begin to see, if you have the eyes to see, that there's a great deal of symbolism that's shrouded throughout the hotel. It's based on the concept of the man dragon or the mandrake plant. And I believe it's a direct connection to the garden event. And so my final thoughts would be that I believe the evidence is stacking up overwhelmingly that the Nakash was a reptilian mandragon entity who came into the garden. He used the love apple to put a spell on Eve and in doing so was able to perpetuate the serpent seed line that has existed all throughout humanity and still exists today. And that's my opinion. And you as the listeners will have to come to your own opinion. But for now, we're going to continue trying to investigate and look at this uh, more thoroughly. And so on that note, Godspeed, and we'll see you on the next one.